Quoting Wikipedia, the online open source encyclopedia, we find that, quote, According to genetic and fossil evidence, archaic Homo sapiens evolved to anatomically modern humans solely in Africa between 200,000 and 100,000 years ago, with members of one branch leaving Africa by 60,000 years ago and over time replacing earlier human populations such as Neanderthals and Homo erectus." End quote. Likewise, quote, an estimate of the total number of humans who have ever lived was prepared by Carl Hobb of the Nonprofit Population Reference Bureau in 1995 and was subsequently updated in 2002 in 2011. The 2011 figure was approximately 107 billion. Hobb characterized this figure as an estimate that required selecting population sizes for different points from antiquity to the present and applying assumed birth rates to each period. Several other scholarly estimates published in the first decade of the 21st century give figures ranging from approximately 100 billion to 115 billion. End quote. Consulting the census.gov population clock website, we find the world population as of September 12th, 2015 the time of this writing's second draft, was around 7,272,000,000 people alive. As of 2020, world population has passed 7.6 billion. So around 107 billion modern Homo sapiens have lived and died on our planet Earth over the last 200,000 years and around 7 billion people are alive on this planet right now. If we factor current population into how many people lived before now, we have a rough estimate figure of around 114 billion people, each one genetically unique, to have ever lived. In Richard Linklater's 2001 film, waking life. A character is conversing with another in chapter 5, quote, about reincarnation and where all the new souls come from over time. Everybody always says that they've been the reincarnation of Cleopatra or Alexander the Great. I always want to tell them they were probably some dumb fuck like everybody else. I mean, it's impossible. Think about it. The world population has doubled in the past 40 years, right? So if you really believe in that ego thing of one eternal soul, then you have only 50% chance of your soul being over 40. And for it to be over 150 years old, then it's only one out of six. The truth about metempsychosis, or the continued survival of the soul as a container for the mind of memories and a self-awareness after the death of the biological body which serves as its vessel while alive is this the soul dissipates across more and more vast a distance over time and the ego dissolves more and more the thinner it is spread the soul or vessel for the continued existence of a mind as memories and ego after bodily death is a mental form of being itself. Shared memories revolving around the ego of a survivor may provide the hungry ghost of one recently deceased a place of refuge in their early afterlife existence, but over the generations these memories even if passed down, will begin to fade into vagueness and their preservations become distorted. 
eventually the soul in the form of a person's memories and the minds of later people will resemble a diametric opposition to everything the original person stood for. Every being whose memories we devote time to recalling frequently continues to exist even after their body's biological death as a fragmented mental only form of being inside our own minds. This part of the other being becomes detached from its originator's persona and becomes attached to our own and often this mental reflection can oppose and conflict with its supposed source. The more person A thinks about and dwells upon their ideal of person B, the less person B will be able to relate with, let alone live up to, the image held up for them by person A. Admiration, appreciation, even familial affection, yet mixed with complex fears, are common symptoms of this syndrome, but it is not driven by only either extreme feelings of compassion or distrust, but both. Obsession is the mother of all love-hate relationships. Whether you are voyeuristically stalking someone because you think about them constantly in a good way or in a bad way is ultimately irrelevant from both the behavioristic point of view that considers stalking a privacy invasion crime and the psychoanalytical point of view that considers obsession a mental illness. Sometimes the psychology of a person comes to believe itself dispossessed by its original ego or central self-concept and become possessed by something or someone else. This can occur as psychogenic fugue states, such as in multiple personality syndrome, which was originally discovered by psychologists studying the Nazi concentration camp physicians during the Nuremberg trials, which found that most of them had developed MPD to cope with the inhumanities they were being told to commit. Were these men possessed? If possession by evil ghosts can occur, to what extent is chosen reincarnation an attempt by good ghosts to combat them in this middle ground or physical plane? The manner in which love-hate and obsession relate to metempsychosis or the preservation of the soul after death is that the more people remember a historical figure after the death of that actual person, the longer the person's soul lives on in history beyond their own lifetime. People with large cult followings after their deaths suffer the fate of having their memories recalled for a longer time, yet watching helplessly as their original ego is slowly misinterpreted, misrepresented, misconstrued and ultimately becomes irrelevant to the independent existence of their memories. Nevertheless, this method of surviving bodily death as a soul proves 100% effective 100% of the time, much more than can be said for any other theory regarding preservation of the soul after bodily death or proposition about the nature of the afterlife for such. The Ego once independent of the body and in the form of a soul, does not make direct replications of itself in the form of the increased scattering apart of direct memories about them. The ego, once a bodiless soul, has no means of causing any outcome to occur unless it fully possesses the mind of a later living body. If a soul enters a living body, and does so prior to any other soul entering that living body. Is that body then not the body of that soul itself and that soul alone? So who is to say when the soul first enters the living body of a biological organism, or how? There are not human and non-human spirits. There are not even technically human or non-human souls. For example, dogs have souls too, but when the dog's body dies, as with the humans, their soul leaves the body and it ceases to be the soul of a dog or of a human and becomes simply a soul, 
a torus of electromagnetic energy flowing in a more or less unique pattern on its surface. Let us consider the soul as a pattern of energy by examining the nature of a similar, more commonly perceived object with similar physical properties, a soap bubble. So let us say that the soap bubble shape of the soul is called the aura, that the soap part of the bubble is the ego, that the water molecules in the soap bu bubble are the memories held together in a tensile structure by the soap, and that the contents of the bubble would be mind, in the sense that there is air inside the bubble alike the same air outside it, yet they are separated by the surface of the bubble. There is mind within the aura of the soul, and there is mind beyond the aura of the soul, and though they are both of the same sort of substance, a zero-point energy field, they are slightly unlike, and this difference is measured as the ego. So the soul is a wave of mind within a universal zero-point energy field, also of mind as well. How does one, while living, seek to access this greater universal scale of mental energy, and by doing so, how does one seek to increase their own soul to better preserve their memories in this cosmic acacia? Just as a soap bubble of air can temporarily float in a medium of air, so can a bubble containing air rise toward the surface of a body of water. When the exterior surface tension is greater than the interior, the bubble is less likely to pop than when they are exactly equalized, when it is most likely to pop. So, when the mind outside the aura of the soul, of the ego, and the mind inside equate, the bonds between memories formed by the ego break apart, and the ego ceases to be a cohesive unifier for them. The truth about the existence or non-existence of the theist hypothesis for deity is that, regardless of what anyone believes about their own concept of God, this idealization they envision both exists and non-exists simultaneously. In quantum mechanics, this is referred to as superposition. As a fact of solid material reality, the universal space-time continuum of all matter energy, God, in any form imaginable, cannot exist. There is no such thing as a more ideal form of anything that exists. There is only that which exists. Thus, all belief is self-delusion. However, at the same time, what we imagine does have the semblance of solidity within our minds, and thus the appearance of existence to our minds, if not existence in itself as a solid material body, but as a mental-only archetype of all humanity, any mind can conjure up a hallucinated apparition to serve as its definition for deity, if need be. The question then becomes, if something appears to exist only within the mind, is it not equally real to something manifest as a definite empirical fact, but that is beyond the mind's present reach and unknown? Traditionally, the existential argument posited by biology is that existence precedes essence, meaning the body evolved before the mind, which is then merely an appendage of the body, and that our perceptions, easily deceived, are all that allow us to become aware of the nature of our surrounding environment. However, the cosmological argument posed by quantum mechanics and astrophysics posits that operant observer principle, the presence of an actively interfering factor from a higher vantage position above all the rest, is a necessary facet for explaining how the uncertainty principle can yield atomic structure. 
according to the uncertainty principle, a quantum object that is not being directly observed exists in a condition of superposition or multiple quantum states simultaneously. The usual comparison is a cat in a box that is both dead and alive simultaneously because we cannot see it. This is in brief. The actual allegory is more complex. Is God, then, both dead and alive at once? If it were not for this mysterious law of physics governing quantum size scales, then there could not be a mystery about whether or not there is such a thing as God, and yet, though we perceive the solution, we don't yet apprehend it. Picture it like a coin. On one side is the face of God, all that is good, all we imagine as being more ideal and better than what is. And on the reverse side of the coin is the tail of the devil, all that is base, all we can know and apprehend as being empirical facts about our surrounding material reality, even though dependent on our own flawed senses to comprehend. When this coin spins, the two appear to be one. The coin spins while we watch it, but when we look away, the coin stops revolving and falls flat onto one side or the other, either symbolically good as an ideal god or evil as base matter. This is the true nature of reality, that what we believe is just an illusion, created by the motion of polar opposites that, whenever we do not sustain their duality by direct observation, cannot coexist and collapse into a singular form that is, in truth, all that really is.